Utopia by Sir Thomas More Concerning the best state of a commonwealth and the new island of Utopia A truly golden handbook, no less beneficial than entertaining by the most distinguished and eloquent author, Thomas More Citizen and under-sheriff of the famous city of London Thomas More to Peter Giles Greetings My very dear Peter Giles, I am almost ashamed to be sending you, after nearly a year, this little book about the utopian commonwealth, which I am sure you expected in less than six weeks. For, as you are well aware, I faced no problem in finding my materials, and had no reason to ponder the arrangement of them. All I had to do was repeat what you and I together heard Raphael describe. There was no occasion either for labour over the style, since what he said, being extempore and informal, couldn't be couched in fancy terms. And besides, as you know, he is a man not so well versed in Latin as in Greek, so that my language would be nearer the truth, the closer it approached to his casual simplicity. Truth, in fact, is the only quality at which I should have aimed, or did aim, in writing this book. I confess, friend Peter, that having all these materials ready to hand left hardly anything at all for me to do. Otherwise, thinking through a topic like this from scratch and disposing it in proper order might have demanded no little time and work even if a man were not entirely deficient in talent and learning. And then, if the matter had to be set forth with eloquence, not just factually, there is no way I could have done that, however hard I worked, for however long a time. But now, when I was relieved of all these problems, over which I could have sweated forever, there was nothing for me to do but to simply write down what I had heard. Well, little as it was, that task was rendered almost impossible by my many other obligations. Most of my day is given to the law, pleading some cases, hearing others, compromising others, and deciding others still. I have to visit this man because of his official position, and that man because of his business, and almost the whole day is devoted to other people's business, and the rest to my own, and then for myself, that is, my studies, there's nothing left. For when I get home, I have to talk with my wife, chatter with my children, and consult with the servants. All these matters I consider part of my business, since they have to be done, unless a man wants to be a stranger in his own house. Besides, you are bound to bear yourself as agreeably as you can towards those whom nature, or chance, or your own choice has made companions for your life. But of course you mustn't spoil them with your familiarity, or by overindulgence turn the servants into your masters, and so... Amid these concerns, the day, the month, and the year slip away. What time do I find to write, then? Especially since I still take no account of sleeping, or even of eating, to which many people devote as much time to as sleep itself, which consumes almost half of our lives. My own time is only what I steal from sleeping and eating. It isn't very much, but it is something. And so I've finally been able to finish Utopia, even though belatedly, and I am sending it to you now. I hope, my dear Peter, that you read it over and let me know if you find anything that I have overlooked, though I am not really afraid of having forgotten anything important. I wish my judgement and learning were up to my memory, which isn't half bad. Still, I don't feel so sure of it as I would swear I have missed nothing. For my servant John Clement has raised a great doubt in my mind. As you know, he was there with us, for I always want him to be present at conversation where there's profit to be gained. And one of these days I expect we'll get a fine crop of learning from this young Sprout, who's already made excellent progress in Greek as well as Latin. Anyhow, as I recall matters, Hitlerday said the bridge over the Andra Amaro was 500 yards long, but my John says that it's 200 yards too much that in fact the river is not more than 300 yards wide there. So I beg you, consult your memory. If your recollection agrees with his, I'll yield to the two of you, 
and confess myself mistaken. But if you don't recall the point, I'll follow my own memory and keep my present figure. For as I've taken particular pains to avoid having anything false in this book, so if anything is in doubt, I'd rather say something untrue than tell a lie. In short, I'd rather be honest than clever. But the whole matter can easily be cleared up if you ask Raphael about it, either face to face or else by letter. And I'm afraid you must do this anyway, because of another problem that has cropped up. Whether through my fault or yours or Raphael's, I'm not sure. For it didn't occur to us to ask, nor to him to say, in what area of the new world Utopia is to be found. I wouldn't have missed hearing about this for a sizable sum of money, for I'm quite ashamed not to even know the name of the ocean where this island lies about which I have written so much. Besides, there are various people here, and one in particular, a devout man and a professor of theology, who very much wants to go to Utopia. His motive is not by any means idle curiosity, a hankering after new sights, but rather a desire to foster and further the growth of our religion, which has made such a happy start there. To do this properly, he has decided to arrange to be sent there by the Pope, and even to be named Bishop of the Utopians. He feels no particular scruples about applying for this post, for he considers it a holy ambition, arising not from motives of glory or gain, but simply from religious zeal. Therefore I beg you, my dear Peter, to get in touch with Hithliday, in person if you can, or by letter if he's gone, and make sure that my work contains nothing false and omits nothing true. It would probably be just as well to show him the book itself. If I've made a mistake, there's nobody better qualified to correct me. But even he cannot do it unless he reads over my book. Besides, you'll be able to discover in this way whether he's pleased or annoyed that I've written the book. If he has decided to write out his own story himself, he may not want me to do so. And I shall be sorry too if in publicising the Utopian Commonwealth I had robbed him and his story of the flower of novelty. But to tell the truth, I'm still of two minds as to whether I should publish this book at all. For the tastes of mortals are so various, the tempers of some are so severe, their minds so ungrateful, their judgments so foolish, that there seems no point in publishing something, even if it's intended for their advantage, that they will receive only with contempt and ingratitude. Better simply to follow one's own natural inclinations, lead a merry life, and ignore the vexing problems of publication. Most people know nothing of learning, many despise it. The clod rejects as too difficult, whatever isn't cloddish. The pedant dismisses as mere trifling, anything that isn't stuffed with obsolete words. Some readers approve only of ancient authors. Many men like only their own writing. Here's a man so solemn he wouldn't allow a shadow of levity, and there's one so insipid of taste that he can't endure the salt of a little wit. Some dullards dread satire, as a man bitten by a rabid dog dreads water. Some are so changeable that they like one thing when they're seated and another when they're standing. These people lounge around the taverns, and as they swill their ale, pass judgment on the intelligence of writers. With complete assurance, they condemn every author by his writings, just as they think best, plucking each one, as it were, by the beard. But they themselves remain safe, and, as the proverb has it, out of harm's way. No use trying to lay hold of them, they're shaved so close there's not as much hair on their head to catch them by. Finally, some people are so ungrateful that even though they're delighted with the work, they don't like the author any better because of it. They are like rude guests who, after they have stuffed themselves with a splendid dinner, go off, carrying their full bellies homeward without a word of thanks to the host who invited them. A fine task, providing, at your own expense, a banquet for men of such finicky palates and such various tastes who will remember and reward you with such thanks. At any rate, my dear Peter, will you take up with Hithliday the points that I spoke of? After I've heard from him, I'll take a fresh look at the whole matter. But since I've already taken the pains to write up the subject, 
it's too late to be wise. In the matter of publication, I hope we can have Hithloday's approval. After that, I'll follow the advice of my friends, and especially yours. Farewell, my dear Peter Giles. My regards to your excellent wife. Love me as you have always done. I am more fond of you than ever.